Hi, I'm Rose Martin and we're right around the corner. Can you guess where I am? Beautiful Eggleston, Virginia, and I'm sitting in the Palisades restaurant. We're going on a journey today to learn all about the lost communities of Virginia. As you've traveled around, have you ever stumbled upon an old general store and you wondered what was going on in there years ago? Or maybe you've seen railroad tracks that seem to go nowhere and you think, you know, at one time they were bustling and connecting communities. Well, that's what it's all about. So come on a journey with me and let's meet a woman who has traveled with an atlas across the state of Virginia, uncovering and discovering the lost communities of Virginia. She's the author of several books about local history. She's interested in preservation and sustainable design. She even finds time to explore back roads. She plays the clarinet, she makes art, and is rehabilitating an historic house in the once booming town of Narrows, where she is active in helping to revitalize downtown. I think we should meet her. Terry Fisher, welcome to Right Around the Corner. Thank you, Rose. It's glad, I'm glad to be here. Oh, uh, well, we are so excited. And t traveling into this beautiful area today, I can see why this book is such a labor of love. You. So you are associated with a specific part of Virginia Tech. What is it? I work at the Community Design Assistance Center at Virginia Tech. It's an outreach center of the College of Architecture and Urban Studies. And we assist uh, nonprofits, communities, and civic groups with their needs related to the natural and built environment. So improving that area, like with trails and parks and um, facade designs, things like that, interior space planning. And students provide the work, so they get mm -hmm. to uh, engage with the communities and provide the designs and research that we do. Oh, how interesting. Now, did the Lost Communities book come out of a project at Virginia Tech? It really kind of did because most all of our projects are in rural communities because we work for places that can't afford a private consultant, so they mm -hmm. use us instead. And in going to all of those rural communities, we go through other rural communities. And as we did that, we would see the small communities, the towns, the churches and stores and things mm -hmm. like that and wonder about them and be really curious about what made them tick at one time and why they were much more vital at one time than they are today. So what is a lost, lost community? It's a place that has lost a transportation mode, like for instance a stagecoach might not come through there mm -hmm. or the train might stop anymore. Uh, they may have lost a industry like a mill or coal or something like that. Um, or they've just lost a way of life, so they may not be farming anymore, so you may not have the general store with the um, potbelly stove in the middle where everybody meets and, sure. and such anymore. Because they were hubs of all kinds of social activity. Yes. You would meet in a place and it was the community center, right? Yes, yes. So you started out with 2,600 communities. How yes. on earth did you narrow it down to 130? Okay, my co-author, Kirsten Sparenborg, who was an architecture intern at Virginia Tech, um, she was working for CDAC. She actually took the, the Gazetteer of Virginia, which is the big red map book. She looked at it and found the 2,600 small communities, and then she started driving. And so she took photographs of places that still had uh, things in them, something. Because mm -hmm. you'll, you'll drive around and you'll find places that just have a little green sign mm -hmm. that says there's something there and right. there's not really anything anymore. <laughs> so she took photographs of the places that still had buildings or uh, train track or something in there that she could see that there was still some sort of community. And then that got narrowed down ultimately by a group of professors at, uh, in the College of Architecture to the 30 that we ended up with today. And those are the ones that are included in your book? Yes. So when you look at um, a lost community, so we, if, if it's missing something, I can understand how it's lost. But I read in here that you've categorized the communities in mm -hmm. order to further drill down a little bit so people can explore and really learn about them. Right. How, did you, how did you decide and what are those categories of communities? Well, we just really kind of looked at the types of communities to, to come up with the, the definitions of the seven different types. So there's gathering places. Those are places um, like courthouse towns where everybody came to go to court or mm -hmm. to, um, you know, you might have to file your marriage license or your land license or, you know, all those different things in the court. And it, in earlier years, you probably had to stay there when you went because it was a long trip mm -hmm. and on your horse. <laughs> right. And so you might have to stay at the hotel that was there and the tavern and such. Um, so those became gathering places. Uh, there's other things like a general store that might be in the middle of a, an area that is the gathering place or a mill. Mm -hmm. um, there are also cultural enclaves. And those are places that are um, usually defined by 
economic class, uh, racial divisions, uh, culture, or religion. So like the Pamunkey Indian Reservation is included in here because they've got their own mm, enclave sure. really um, in the eastern part of the state. But there's also uh, a community, Jerome, in Shenandoah County that was settled by German Lutherans. Mm -hmm. Or there's uh, Almagro and Danville City that's an African American community. So those are mm -hmm. kind of the different kinds of cultural enclaves. Um, there are also transportation hubs. And so those might be places that the train stopped and that was uh, the reason for their being there at all. It might be a stagecoach stop, mm -hmm. or it could even be a steamboat stop, as mm -hmm. some places in the Northern Neck are. Um, there are also uh, resource extraction towns. So those would be places where you were exploiting the natural resources of mining. the area, like mm -hmm. mining timber, um, mm -hmm. iron ore, things like that. Or, uh, and some of those turned into company towns where right. uh, the company was actually building the entire town, the company that was doing the resource extraction. Something like Bassett and Galax in that area? Right, those would be, um, exactly, okay. those would be company town okay. kind of places, yeah. So even not necessarily resource extraction, but furniture building furniture, or sure. woolen mills in okay. Danville. That kind of well, we're in such a beautiful little place right here. So yes. in Eggleston, in this beautiful little Palisades restaurant, this wasn't always a restaurant. No, it was not. What's the story? And, Okay, this is actually the place where our project began because Kirsten uh, Sparenborg was driving to another uh, project that CDAC, Community Design Assistance Center, we call it CDAC, mm -hmm. um, had. And she decided to follow the sign off of 460 here in Giles County that says Eggleston to see what was out here. And so she came out here, and at the time, this building was open as a general store still. And Gladys mm. Dowdy ran the general store. Mm -hmm. And so she, Kirsten and Gladys got to talking about what the history of the place was. And mm -hmm. this was a different sort of community that I didn't mention before, which is a resort community. Okay. At one time, there was the Eggleston Springs Resort that was down by the New River. Um, so all of Eggleston was a resort community? Well, yes and no. Okay. This was not here at the time. This okay. was a resort community. Um, but the that was kind of the initial reason for it because there was a spring here it's called gunpowder springs and in fact the gift shop next door is mm -hmm. called gunpowder springs for that um, and it smelled like sulfur <laughs> and that's how <laughs> so it became its name gunpowder spring yeah and were they also the healing springs um they probably did heal some here okay. but they're because i was reading i was fascinated what you wrote in here about right. the healing springs and how people would come and right. believe that they were going to be healed by the by the yes. natural waters and and every water of every spring is a little bit different so they sure. were healing different things okay. but yes yeah so that was kind of the original reason for this and actually if you go down by the river here you'll see the beautiful formations in the limestone still mm. um, that were part of the draw here okay. as well uh, but then later on, the railroad came through here, and it came on both sides of the river because the Norfolk and Western was on one side and the Virginian Railroad was on the other side, and that kind of brought the end to the Springs Resorts because of all the noise and the smoke from the steam oh, trains sure. and all of that sure. stuff. Um, but it made Eggleston a hub for transportation in this part of the county and part of um, Montgomery County as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of changed the the tone of the community. So this could be a transportation hub as well as a, a mm -hmm. um, resort community. And as I said to you before too, um, this community, if you pay attention, the road, there are roads here from everywhere. Yeah, you said, so told you me can, all roads lead all to Eggleston. All roads lead to Eggleston, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> and that's part of the reason why is because people needed to get to the, the railroad. Okay, so this, where we're sitting now, used to be the general store. Yes, it did. Oh, yeah. interesting. So what would it have looked like at that time? Uh, it looked actually very similar to what it does hmm. today because all these shelves and stuff are still mm -hmm. here. And some of the um, things in here, I believe the bar actually was part of the um, counter mm -hmm. from the original store. And I think actually the tables are made from something related oh, to the store wonderful. as well. So she used parts of... And I noticed when, when you were talking about Eggleston, you bring a historical part into each of these little lost communities too, because you even, I was interested to hear that Mary Ingalls Wilder walked over 400 miles and yes. ended up close. So when you were trying to find the journey of how to tie these towns together, when you, how did you find the information that you thought, you know, this should go into this lost community story. This should go into this lost community story. Yeah, I really looked up as much information as I really could. And, and we also spoke to people who lived here. So you'll find in the book, there are a lot of quotes from people who had lived here many years and have their own experiences from living here, as well as history that they'd been told over the years. So 
in a lot of cases I tried to make sure I could find out whether those things were true that they said. Which right. was not always easy <laughs> sure. to do or actually in some cases down. they weren't true at all. Huh. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I did that and then I did a lot of just research and trying to find out what the interesting nuggets were and what also tied the history of Virginia or these communities to the history of Virginia and mm -hmm. the nation and the world really because there are things like the depression of 1893, the financial panic, right. that we don't really know all that much about mm -hmm. now. But there were so many of these communities that that was actually an issue and caused either a uh, manufacturing facility to disappear or um, they decided to not mine in that one place because of this financial panic and so they had designed an entire town and just abandoned it. You know, things mm. like that happened um, that are really kind of a national sort of uh, history. Now did you find that people when they would abandon those towns they moved to other little towns in Virginia? What happened? So then the, the buildings became abandoned like we knew with the general stores or the railroads leading to nowhere. But do you have a sense from the quotes and the stories that people told you where people went or how they sustained life? Well in some cases uh, and one example actually is um, mineral um, in Louisa County and they had set out a plan for a community that was going to be, um, I think it's 52 blocks, something like mm. that. It was really large. They were calling it Mineral City. And it was based on the gold deposits and pyrite and copper and mm -hmm. other assorted minerals that there are right. in that area. And then the financial panic came along. So they had platted out the town, but not built it out yet. Mm -hmm. And so they just left. I don't know exactly where they went at that time, but the, the people hadn't actually built their houses yet. So oh. when you go there now, there's only a few blocks mm -hmm. that were built out, but you can see in places where the streets were supposed to go. And things. Oh, sure. You know, when I was reading your book, I was fascinated that some places I didn't know of. I, I had no yeah. idea where they were. And then there were others which was exciting. I'm looking, I'm like, oh, I know where that is. I've yeah. been there. One of the examples is Paint Bank. Mm -hmm. I used to um, live in Craig County, so that's a really, sp they hold a real special place in my heart. Yes. And it's such a beautiful part of the country. Mm -hmm. And having lunch at the Swinging Bridge yes. and being up visiting there. But what I found really intriguing was you know, I didn't know the Native American part of that story and then how, how that all fit together. What are some interesting things about that area? Right, well the Native American part that you're mentioning was that there was red clay on the banks of the uh, Potts Creek that's up there and so mm -hmm. they used that for creating bricks and making the houses red and, and such like that. Um, the mill that's up there, the original mill. Um, Tingler's mill? Yeah, Tingler's mm -hmm. mill. The original mill that had been there was actually the head rights for the water were bought by William Preston who owned Smithfield Plantation in Blacksburg. Oh. So there's a connection up. Uh, that way, which, is which is another beautiful area, yes. right? <laughs> yes. mm. um, but one thing that I find interesting is when you go up to Paint Bank, there's a train depot, but mm -hmm. there's no sign of a train or anything anymore. Right. And however, if you happen to go up to Paint Bank from um, Ripple Mead in Giles County, you'll be following the old train bed going up there. Mm. Um, and they used to mine iron ore in Paint Bank and they needed a way to get it out and that was how they connected to the Norfolk Western Railroad was through Ripple Mead. So they came down that road that comes mm. out of there, which is the flatway, which um, if you are prone to car sickness as I am, that's the best way to get <laughs> Exactly, <to> <laughs> right? Exactly. Though some of those twists and turns yeah. right, we are here in Southwest Virginia. I knew right. even coming here to, you know, for to this, going <laughs> these, these crosses, it's beautiful. You yes. won't find scenery any prettier, yes. I think, anywhere in the state. Yes. But it definitely is a little, a little what hard if you're a little nervous stomach. Yes. So <laughs> when, you, when you look at calling this the Lost Communities of Virginia, we've talked mm -hmm. a lot about Southwest Virginia, but what about other areas of the state? We did try to cover all of the state. We didn't want to be specific to Southwest, sure. although there certainly are well, a lot down here, in our hearts. and we're yeah. closer to it from sure. Virginia Tech. Um, but there are some definitely in the other parts of the state. Uh, we have one out on the eastern shore, we have mm -hmm. some on the northern neck, um, so we have spread out. Um, the stories are different over there. Sure. So one of my favorites actually is Sharps in, on the northern neck in Richmond County and their story is about steamboats because mm -hmm. you couldn't easily get to the northern neck exactly. in the early days and the roads were just terrible once they had them so their road was the Rappahannock River and they went on the steamboats mm -hmm. to get everywhere that they needed to go and they got everything in and out that they needed to go their mail 
uh, people, commodities, um, everything went that way. Mm -hmm. And they were more connected to Baltimore because of that, because they would go out the Rappahannock River into the Chesapeake Bay and sure. go to Baltimore. So I'm curious, as you've been you know, investigating and journeying and being an adventurer all around the state, were there any stories that surprised you when you uncovered them um, that you just knew you had to get in this book to share with people? <laughs> Um, I, I think that some of the stories that I found in here um, were some of the more difficult stories in some cases because there were a number of um, segregation stories mm, that were difficult sure. um, throughout the book that mm -hmm. were told. Um, but I think there's a lot of exciting stories and interesting stories. You know, I, like the steamboat was interesting mm -hmm. to me. The um, coal mining just turned out to be interesting to me, how the, the different um, communities were created and um, how that all played through time and that some of the early communities like uh, Stonega and Derby, they were trying really hard to keep the uh, labor unions out. So they were sure. uh, trying to be nicer and have better houses and um, they were exercising social paternalism is what they called it, giving mm. their workers a little bit extra money so they wouldn't join the unions, but then that all fell apart in the Depression. So it was kind of interesting to read those kinds of stories too and learn more about how all of these things are worked. Well, and that's one of the things I love about this because it's, it's historical and sometimes it's narrative because of the way you have those, those stories and those, and those quotes, but then it's also a photo anthology with all of the beautiful pictures that you've gone out and placed so carefully in here. And you know, the, the, what you weave through here is so beautifully done because of the, the historical, the, the, um, the photographs, the stories of the people. And with each community, you can read a section of the book. You can read, go to the back and read about one. And then you can decide, where do you want to go? You know, how are you going to get in the car and go on a, go on a little road trip to discover some things? And right. you've, you've got some ways that people can do that. Yes, we had a number of people that were actually visiting the communities based on the book. And so we decided to start creating some driving tours of okay. places. And so we started with uh, the Southern Driving Tour, which is in Southside, Virginia. It's the um, Halifax, Pennsylvania, um, Charlotte, Campbell, and Appomattox counties. And then we moved on to uh, this area. So the um, back roads of Southwest Virginia tour guide goes into Montgomery, Pulaski, Carroll, and Wythe counties. And what we try to do is uh, give people some roads that they should drive on that are back roads, that are safe back roads, because there were some that I drove on that mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to send anybody on. <laughs> they were beautiful. Right. <laughs> um, and, and point out where the historic and interesting places are on those roads as they go, and give them information about stopping at some of those historic places and such. So these are actually maps. We're not yes. pulling out our smartphone. No, we're not. We're not doing this digitally, right? We're right, we're using a map, yes. and we are just on a track across Virginia. Right. Oh, yes. how exciting! Yes. Yes. How yes. exciting! Yes. We have plans to try to to do them in the. Um, on the smartphone, but mm -hmm. one problem with that is you would need to download it before you left because there's a lot of these places that don't have cell phone coverage. That so. was going to be my question because you go out and you're riding around and you check your phone and it's a good time to just put it away, right. put it in your pocket, leave it in the you know glove yeah. box because you're not going to have service anyway. Right. And sometimes just look outside, yes. you know, and yeah. just appreciate how beautiful it is. Yes, and there are so many beautiful places mm. in those because I. I was the one that actually drove around and figured out the tours for the oh, back roads did. of South ah. West Virginia. I drove all over these counties and it was just amazing. I bet. There were, there were some amazing roads that you wouldn't believe were out there, and then, <laughs> mm -hmm. but they were beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, and I you're just like, wouldn't I'm not sure this send, is a road. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't want to send other people out there, but they were beautiful. And then the ones that we've chosen for this mm -hmm. are, are good roads with that give you a good feeling for what the uh, counties are like. So when I was looking at these maps and I'm trying to figure out where would be a place to go, we know that seasonally in Virginia there are places you go and then you might not go. The beautiful um, dogwoods, the beautiful trees coming out in spring, do you have a favorite location that you like to get behind the wheel and, and just go and visit? 
Uh, well, I like, <laughs> I actually like to drive around in the mountains. Do you? Um, okay. Yeah. They're really quite beautiful any time of year. Uh, and I think today was actually a really good example because there's no leaves on the trees, but there was incredible views off into the mountains uh, with the snow on the top the and such. I same thing driving through there. Yeah. And I was also thinking, I don't ride motorcycles, but I thought for people who like to get out on bicycles or motorcycles, right. that I can see why it would just be so amazing to yes. just ride around and enjoy that. And plenty of places to picnic, yes. plenty of places to take um, great shots. Right. So if you've got a yeah. camera, you're a photo enthusiast, right. that would also be something to be able to do, along with n wildlife, right? Yes. Nature, excuse me, birds, right. so many things to see and, and visit. Hiking and stuff too as well, so yeah. There's no reason to stay inside. No. And we definitely all. all need to put our phones away, right? <laughs> yes. Pop it away and go out and enjoy the beautiful, the beautiful lost communities of Virginia. Yes. Some that are thriving and some that are coming back. Absolutely. Just like this little restaurant, yes. right? That was yes. once a general store to be able to come back and sit here and have a meal and look around and think, wow. Yeah, it has great atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. and it history. Sure does. You can feel the history here. This is obviously such a passion for you. Why is it so important? Well, I think it's important to me because we have so much history around here, and uh, we really just a lot of times just talk about, especially here in Virginia, the eastern part of the state and right. what happened over there, and Jamestown and Williamsburg and Richmond and places like that, and really there's so much history in each small community and each one is different in some way mm -hmm. um, and it really helps connect you to the place that you live. And that's important, right? To yes. be connected yes. where we live and within our communities. Mm -hmm. So what would you like people to take away from this book? What would you like them to do? I would like you to be curious. Okay. <laughs> I would like everybody to be curious about the places that they live learn more about them because you just never know what's going on there, what has happened there, what the history is, how it connects to the larger world because you really are just kind of in your own little microcosm mm -hmm. if you like, but really that you're in the larger world and your history in your community connects to that larger world. So I think it's important to be curious. And So I'm curious, yes. will you read a passage for us? Sure. All right. Glad to. So one of the things going through the book, I was trying to think, gosh, what would I read if I had a chance to, to yeah. <laughs> share with people a little bit about this? So let's see what you picked. I picked something from the epilogue here. Um, no place is stagnant. Things are always in a constant state of motion. Sometimes the motion may be slow as in the shifting sands of a desert, but other times the change can be much quicker as in the collapse of the World Trade Center. Change is generally slower, but still measurable in the lost communities of Virginia. Some of the residents interviewed has passed away in the intervening years, taking with them their memories of people, places, events, and times past. While the loss of a storyteller may not be visible to outsiders, it creates a hole in the fabric of the continuity of the place. That person's perception of the community is lost. Family members may be able to recite some of the stories, but their own personal life experiences and perspective make the remembering and the telling of the story different than that of the original storyteller and of the person who originally experienced the event. More obvious to the outsider is the loss of businesses, buildings, railroad tracks, fields, and other visible signs of community. As these visible reminders of community are lost, newer residents and those passing through are less aware of the place that once was. They may see a collapsing building, but they don't see the people who once frequented the store, sat around its pot-bellied stove gossiping and playing checkers, and visited with friends on its porch steps. They don't see the busy Saturday nights when everyone came to town in their wagons or new cars to shop for the week and catch the nickel movie. They don't see the train loads of coal and lumber, the tomato and oyster canneries running at full tilt, the tobacco markets in action, or the bustle of harvest time. Missing are the children walking to the one-room school, the girls walk, working for weeks sewing a new dress, and their mothers cooking for days in preparation for the big August meeting, and the men bartering as they wait in line at the grist mill. Missing is the sense of excitement that permeated the town when the train or steamboat delivered news, mail, and people, when traveling entertainers visited, or when court was in session. Also missing are the hard times that residents faced during the Civil War and the Depression because their skin was a different color or they spoke a different language and from their long, physically exhausting work days. Many of the places highlighted in lost communities of Virginia have changed perceptibly since we visited, some negatively and some positively. The Pocahontas Company store collapsed, the automobile garage at Capeville was raised, buildings at Manita and Mendota have been overgrown with trees and vines, but triumphs include Boydton's downtown revitalization, Paint Bank's reinvention as a tourism destination, the reopening of Eggleston's store as the Palisades restaurant, the guarantee that Pamplin's pipe kiln will remain a protected archeological site in perpetuity, 
and the restoration of Woodford's train station in one of the neglected homes in Sharps. Each change ushers in a new phase in the history of the community. While the original boom times are lost, a new prosperity can be invented. In Paint Bank, for example, outside speculators once came in to exploit the natural resources of iron and timber. Today's prosperity comes from tourists wishing to enjoy the natural resources of the mountains, forests, and trout streams. Natural resources remain the draw, but the intent is different. Each of the lost communities moves forward, some with a more defined future than others. Wow, I can feel that. I am so sorry that we are out of time. I know my curiosity is sparked, and I can't wait to get on the road. I think Virginia Tech is very lucky to have you. Oh, thank you very oh, much. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so thank you so much. Special thanks to Terry Fisher for sharing her work, Lost Communities of Virginia. I hope you're going to get on the road, and you never know where I'm going to see you next, right? Because as we all know, I'll see you next time right around the corner.